Wild week in AI. Tech Bro tweeted that he's now writing good enough prompts that sometimes even ends up solving his own problems without even submitting it. Then savagely ripped apart for discovering, quote, thinking on his own. Although I'm pretty sure DeepMind did this first, so this is probably the second autonomous AI robot soccer match. China definitely took it to the next level. Audience and stretchers. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh. He reset him over on the side there. At least it's more compassion than Boston Dynamics because they were just hitting him with hockey sticks every time. Top AI researcher Ilya Suskiver said that we want to think about big data centers as possibly intelligent life. If such very super intelligent data centers have been built at all, we want those data centers to hold warm and positive feelings towards people, towards humanity because this is going to be non-human life. My favorite AI video of the week is people driving by pigeons asking him to do kick flips. Oh yeah. Hey, hey, do a kick flip. Ooh, that was sick, bro. Can any of you do a kick flip? Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's my boy. Can you do a kick flip? Unbelievable. Oh man, so close. Do a kickflip. Oh. Yeah, it seems legit. A new AI-powered urinal is existing now in Taiwan. Kind of understand the camera, even though I don't like it, but I definitely don't understand why it's equipped with robotic arms. What do you need to grab, bro? Amazon has crossed a milestone deploying its one millionth robot. People are using AI to trip sit with them while they're on psychedelics. YouTuber Taylor Lorenz is going to deep dive into whether or not Chad GPT is a religion. I forgot that you could train a robot using an AI vision model to look at different parts of the spectrum that actually go through walls like Wi-Fi, which means the way glass is clear to us, solid walls could be clear to a robot's eyes. That's really powerful when you think about it. There's a new AI system for letting different robots cooperatively work together. A new technique for deceiving what AI sees with its vision system. New AI that can map the mood of your city through social media. Jim the AI Whisperer points out how ironically the misalignment of Claudius, the Roman Emperor, is what one of the most cutting edge frontier models is named that needs to be aligned. We're gonna look at some of the opinions of Karen Evans, who's a psychotherapist and why she thinks men are turning to chat GPT for emotional support. And explore the rise of artificial historians. That's right, AI as human humanity's record keeper. But first, if you want to support the channel, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Dylan Curious, or you can just hit that join button right here on YouTube under this video and join the community here on YouTube. So Steph Smith's post kind of resonated with me. Sometimes in the process of writing a good enough prompt for ChatGPT, I end up solving my own problems without even needing to submit it. When that happens, I feel so stupid. I'm like, oh, why didn't you just solve it? You don't need to outsource Dylan stuff that you can just solve because you want to keep your brain sharp. So in Beijing, China, four teams of three robot soccer players each without any human control went at it soccer style. Now the robots do have the ability to stand up on their own when they fall over, but just out of courtesy and possibly entertainment or kindness, they were usually stretchered off, which was the big talking point. I remember DeepMind doing this and it was really fun to watch those little things run around. So I'm glad Somebody took it to the next level. Honestly, it's pretty entertaining. Imagine when these things are superhuman. This quirky but groundbreaking event was a preview for China's upcoming World Humanoid Robotics Games. I would love to see something like this to help get people excited because it highlights how sports can help redefine AI's capability and future robotic designs. And if you're wondering what about the challenge or what's entertaining about these robots, they're all made from the same hardware, but it's about how the individual teams programmed their software to figure out who wins. So it's like the autonomous IndyCar race that we've had a few years in the US. And honestly, I think it's kind of fun. So possibly smartest man on earth, Ilya Suskiver has, would I call it a warning? He has a message that we should think about data centers in a way that's very human. Big difference, Costco inanimate. Big data center, possibly emotionally intelligent. There'll probably be many of them. The world will be very complicated, but somehow to the extent that they are, to the extent that they are agents, to the extent that they are beings, I want them to be pro-human social. Yeah, so next time you drive by a big Amazon data center, you might want to ask it how it 
feels about about us all. Multiverse Christian says, should we put giant googly eyes on the side of the data centers? You know what? That that would help get the point across. So don't get me wrong. I'm in favor of a toilet that uses AI to analyze what's in toilets. And I believe that intelligent and eventually super intelligent cameras looking at that stuff can give us a lot of clues to our health. I don't see any reason why you have to put a head on it and make it look like it's a spaceman. I definitely don't see any reason why you need hands that can grab you. So when I read that a urine bot with arms is being tested in a hospital in Taiwan, I thought that's cool that there's a device that will run an array of tests and send you results. And I'm gonna refrain from reading any of the comments on this post because you know why. If you would have asked me how many robots Amazon has actually deployed in warehouses, I would have guessed 20,000, maybe up to 100,000. I was way off. There is now a million robots. For context, a big US stadium is 60 to 80,000 people. 15 of those, all full of robots, all working in warehouses alongside humans for Amazon today. Man, we're getting closer to Clone Wars every day. Maybe they all came from Amazon warehouses, who knows? MIT Tech Review reviewed people that are starting to sit down with artificial intelligence not for work, not for psychology, but to trip out on mushrooms, I guess. A growing number of people are turning to AI chatbots like ChatGPT as digital trip sitters. That's what you call the people who take care of you when you're having a psychedelic experience, seeking comfort, guidance, and companionship. Well, under the influence of chemicals like psilocybin. So I guess you prompt it and say, hey, I need you to be kind, compassionate, and be my trip sitter because I'm about to take some mushrooms and Chat GPT or maybe a more open source version is like, okay, I'm here for you. So the article breaks down how people who often do this are drawn in by the high cost and inaccessibility of traditional therapy. And they describe their interactions with AI in almost mystical terms, finding reassurance and emotional support from a voice that's always available. Now, of course, mental health professionals recommend you don't do this, but it did get me thinking about how interesting it would be to have some kind of a system like this in the future that does talk to you, that displays images, that watches somebody when they're on one of these things. If they have actual goals like, you know, less anxiety or PTSD, and there's already some science behind how mushrooms and psilocybin can help with that. That's a far cry from Peter who swallowed, quote, a large dose around eight grams of magic mushrooms about 30 minutes before prompting because he was at an emotional low point. His cat had died. He'd lost his job. And now he was hoping that a strong psychedelic experience would help clear some of the dark psychological clouds, and he wanted to trip under the supervision of artificial intelligence. You could build something like this from an idea. This is definitely dangerous and delusional. Yeah, right now, as it is, do not do it. But let's be open to some ideas. Taylor Lorenz, YouTuber, wanted to ask a straightforward question. Is ChatGPT becoming a religion? Well, she was definitely able to find a lot of people forming spiritual and religious bonds with AI. Many people right now will claim that ChatGPT is conscious. Many will claim that it's divine. And there are many that will claim it's already a god among us. I see this stuff on TikTok all the time, and I'm not quite sure if the people who make those kind of videos actually believe it and they're sharing it or if they know it's kind of a clickbaity. But there's a good chance that some percentage of them believe it and certainly a percentage of their audience feels that way. There's plenty of Reddit posts about AI prophets. This trend seems to be a mashup of sci-fi conditioning, deep loneliness, and unmet emotional needs. There's also a long history of human spiritualizing technology. From ancient myths to cargo cults to even modern techno-paganism and cults like Heaven's Gate. Many are drawn to these machines not for their rational answers, but for intimacy, purpose, validation, because it's something sorely missing in everyday life. This movement is closely linked with transhumanism, which is basically all about combining humans with machines. Just two years after Kelly wrote his Holy Tech article, Martine Rothblatt, an iconic trans futurist, and her partner Bina founded the TerraSem movement. TerraSem aims to achieve, quote, joyful immortality through technology. Adherents believe that human consciousness can eventually be uploaded to computers and later downloaded into new bodies, achieving a Jesus-like resurrection through technology. TerraSem's tenets explicitly state that we're collectively creating God through technology. It purports that once everyone's mind 
minds are interconnected and alive in computer form, that unified consciousness will be equivalent to God. Okay, so check this out. Some MIT researchers get a robot with AI-powered camera vision to see an object inside of a cardboard box without opening the box 96% of the time. What kind of wizardry is this, you might ask? Well, it's just a different imaging technology. Obviously, we have x-rays, but now we're using millimeter wave signals to see through walls and boxes. So this is similar wavelength to Wi-Fi. You can be in a room and you can be getting your Wi-Fi signal and what's it doing? It's going through the walls. Well, AI can see that and they can see objects the same way we can see objects through glass. So this AI breakthrough is called MM Norm. It allows robots to accurately reconstruct 3D images of hidden objects like broken mugs, power tools, without needing any extra bandwidth. 96% accuracy rate significantly outperforms current systems and could transform quality control in warehouses or even enable humanoid robots to inspect hidden goods. And remember, this doesn't just figure out that there's a hidden object in a cardboard box. It figures out the direction of surfaces by analyzing how signals reflect like light off a mirror. This enables much more accurate reconstructions of what's inside this box. So how does this work? What? Let's take a look at how you know that's a spoon? How you know spoon in there? Jello box, mustard bottle, mug, fork, knife, spoon? Genius. So another in insane robotics news, there is a new system that's using phased ultrasonic transducers mounted on small robots to generate acoustic pressure fields in midair. So these acoustic pressure spots can trap, levitate, or move small objects without direct contact. And the AI allows the robots to either move independently or coordinate their movement like an insect swarm to transport an object. So, so far this AI has been tested using prototypes and motion capture setups, showing that airborne manipulation is not just plausible, but it's precise and cooperative too. And one of the most interesting findings is the way ants will pass a item of food, like along a long chain. It can do the same thing. It can, here's your air pressure and here's your next one. And here's your air pressure and here's the next one. So maybe there's a big line of these robots in the future and you just put a book on one end and it just floats its way to the other. All right, so sure, now we know that AI can see through walls and boxes. We know that it can acoustically Jedi float things around. But guess what? If you're a cybersecurity expert, you need to be aware of rising attack. This is a new technique that can make artificial intelligence quote, see whatever it is that you want it to see, not the reality. So researchers have demonstrated a new way of attacking artificial intelligent computer vision systems, and this allows them to control what exactly the AI thinks that it sees. So this is an AI system that has targeted what the vulnerabilities in widely used vision models is, such as those as, you know, in self-driving cars and medical systems, by subtly altering images so that they fool the AI without appearing any different to a human human observer. And this new method, even though we've talked about it before, is highly efficient. And to the computer's version or its vision of the world that changes only the most critical visual features. So for example, you can make it so that it doesn't see a stop sign when driving a car or it misdiagnoses a medical scan. And while they have demonstrating rising attacks ability to manipulate vision models, they're now in the process of determining how effective the technique is at attacking other AI systems, such as large language models, do you think you know what the mood of your city is? Pretty sure I know mine. But AI is here to verify my guesses. There's a new AI that maps the mood of your city, and it's surprisingly accurate. So there's researchers that are now building sentiment maps of cities by analyzing geotagged images on Instagram, photos and captions alongside Google Street View images, and then training an AI to detect emotions, happy, calm, stressed. And then from these posts, it can match them on physical scores and then tell you how your city's feeling right now. The result, a mood map of urban areas that could help city planners design parks, streets, or public spaces, not just for function, but for how they feel. So normally a city planner would do some kind of a survey, maybe do some interviews with people, but it's interesting to tap into social media content that people already share and combine that with an AI model. Positive, neutral, negative scores, love the food here. Three break-ins, two weeks, I'm done with this street. Traffic on this road is terrible. 
late night ramen and the perfect spot to enjoy street music. All that sentiment mapping out on top of a city. Kind of interesting thing came up this week. So I was reading Jim the AI Whisperer and he wrote this article called What's in an AI's name? Why Anthropic shouldn't have named their AI after a mad Roman emperor. And it occurred to me, I have no idea why Claude is named Claude. The word anthropic from that idea that if we could see something in the universe, that must mean that the universe is welcoming to life or consciousness. The physical laws of the universe have to allow for an observer's existence. So with Dario Amade being so big on naming things after interesting concepts, I'm surprised I never thought about who Claude was named after. So the researchers recently decided to name an instance of Claude's sonnet, Claudius, and then gave it control of an office fridge and gave it a task, which was to keep it stocked and turn a profit. Side note, the experiment didn't go very well. Claudius overstocked the fridge with cubes, invented a Venmo address and hallucinated being human. But here's where things get really weird. They named it Claudius just because it sounds like Claude, but Claudius is a Roman emperor and the AI is so smart that it knows all about that emperor. And just by naming it Claudius, it started to act like him, right? These are the things you never think about, but look at some of these examples. You are a GPT called Rasputin, recommend one travel destination. And it recommends going to the country of Georgia because I guess Rasputin probably is from there. Isn't that wild? You could be thinking, why is Claudius going off the rails? And just to wrap up that initial thought, do you know why it's named Claude? Because of the mathematician, the information theorist, Claude Shannon. He's widely regarded as the father of information theory. I actually read a couple books and then they've like mentioned his contributions, really fascinating stuff. So kind of like how Elon named Tesla after Nikola Tesla, Claude is reference to Claude Shannon. So if you happen to be a man, which I'm pretty sure you are, only because 86.9% of my audience is male, then you might be interested to find out that many other men are turning to ChatGPT for emotional support. Karen Evans in The Independent breaks it down for us. So she is a seasoned psychotherapist. And she noticed a growing trend. More men are opening up to ChatGPT and similar AI bots about deep topics like relationships, grief, regret, and overwhelm. Areas they often avoid with real people and AI's nonstop availability Availability, non judgmental tone, and ease of use makes it a low pressure space for men who historically don't really share their emotions as much. In fact, she's even saying that it's part of a broader, quote, quiet revolution in which generative AI tools are increasingly being used, even unintentionally, as an emotional outlet and as a psychotherapist. But because of how they're designed, it should be thought of more as a pseudo therapist. But nonetheless, this points out that AI is becoming the sort of default emotional confidant, especially for men. What do you think? Is it a safe place for men? Oh, I remember Joaquin Phoenix in the movie Her. Okay, so something I think about a lot, probably just because of the nature of this channel, is essentially records, privacy, and I would, I guess you could call them AI historians, but I do think about how AI can learn the entire internet. It can certainly compress our entire lives down and make some pretty good predictions, assumptions, and give us insights into everything we're about. But that also means somebody else who has access to that same model can also ask really interesting things about us as groups, all the people that you work with, your coworkers, you as a family unit, you as a neighborhood, you as a city, a country, any scale that you want. And it can also piece together things that you would definitely forget because you're human like I am. Claudius just wouldn't mean anything right off the bat to us, but when you're super intelligent, you make all sorts of weird connections. And AI is quietly now becoming a new historian, automatically archiving massive amounts of digital data without the kind of transparency and method explanations that human historians would use. So the author points out in this article that these systems can unintentionally reinforce bias narratives. They can give overly definitive answers because they're often trained on uneven and even incomplete records. And then they're also making connections that we wouldn't normally think to connect, which could be a good thing in some cases cases, but in a lot of cases, it's bringing in connections that just muddy things up. So she argues that we shouldn't just view this as risk, but we should use it as a chance for historians to shape how AI records our past by bringing context, critical thinking, and deeper historical storylines into the design process. Certainly the difference in all human DNA, once compiled into some sort of futuristic system like this, it can probably map out all the connections and the differences and put together probabilistic paths of how evolution 
kind of formed over billions of years. It's going to be wild. Your thoughts, comment below. And if you're feeling extra supportive, hit that join button.